Thank you, Lisa. That was beautiful. Good evening. Good evening. Blessed Ascension service to all of you. We have even fewer than we normally have. I should have announced we'd all be questioned. Um, now, there are some people here who say that uh, the CDC has said that some Lutherans may go without masks, others may not. So um, I just heard that tonight for the first time. So um, We are going to be uh, talking about the Ascension this evening, which uh, is appropriate for the Ascension service. We'll also celebrate Holy Communion. Um, and I am very thankful to have you folks here to celebrate Ascension with us. Um, you're the first folks to get to sing the opening hymn in some time, and so we'll be singing Crown Him with Many Crowns, verses 1, 4, and 5, printed on page 2 in your bulletin. Rise for the invocation. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, a poor miserable, miserable sinner, sinner confess, confess unto, unto you all my sins, sins and iniquities with which, which I have ever offended you, you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am but heartily sorry for them. them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. This is our confession. Upon this, your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God and to all of you, and in the place and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, 
In the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the several psalms that mentions the ascension is the most famous, Psalm 110. We read it responsibly in your bulletin on page 3. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch out your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely on the day of your power, in holy splendor, from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, Christ, have mercy mercy upon us. us. Lord, Lord, have have mercy mercy upon us. us. God on high. May the Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. We gather our hearts together in the prayer of the day on page four. Let us pray. Almighty God, God, as as your your only begotten begotten Son, Son, our Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, ascended ascended into heaven, so so may may we also ascend in heart and and mind and and continually continually dwell dwell there there with him, him, who lives and and reigns reigns with you and the the Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit, one One God, now and forever. Amen. may be seated for our first reading. Our first reading for this, the ascension of our Lord is from Acts, the first chapter beginning at the first verse. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. 
And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Ephesians, the first chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the gradual and the gospel reading. In your bulletin at the bottom of page four, you will see the gradual for ascension. Please join with me as we read it together. Christ, Christ has, has risen, risen from, from the, the dead. dead. God, God the, the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. honor. He, he has, has given him dominion over the works, works of, his of his hands. He has, he has put, put all, all things, things under, under his feet. feet. The Holy Gospel for this Ascension service is recorded in Luke chapter 24, beginning at the 44th verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came about that while he was blessing them, he parted from them. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy, 
where they were continually praising the Lord in the temple. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. And our sermon hymn sung by our vocalist is Christ Sits at God's Right Hand. Grace to you in peace from our triune God, who on this day, this Ascension Thursday, permitted his disciples to witness Jesus being lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. The Ascension of Christ is mentioned in one way or another at least 25 times in the New Testament. You have the two historical accounts from Luke and his gospel and in Acts, which you heard read earlier. You have the long ending of Mark. You have Jesus' own prophecies of his ascension and mentioning Psalm 110 this evening, his own prophecy that he was fulfilling that, uh, that Psalm 110 was mentioning him as Lord sitting uh, next to David and with the Lord God the Father. And then you also have numerous references in the epistles about the ascension. And finally, even the apocalypse of John, the book of Revelation, mentions the ascension. The ascension is a big deal in the New Testament. And it probably may explain, at least in part, why if we lived in Europe, there was a very good probability you would have had today off because it's a holiday in most of Europe. The ascension is a big deal also to Jesus, not just because he ascended, but because he saw it as a pivotal moment, really putting it in comparison with the incarnation, elevating ascension and the incarnation really together. And this particular verse you may recall from John 3, as Jesus is having a discourse with the old man Nicodemus, talking about being the new man Nicodemus by coming to faith, Jesus said these words. And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. It's a prophecy of Jesus' ascension, saying that he is the one that ascended. And so Enoch and Elijah, they didn't really have ascension, and you'll understand hopefully by the end of the sermon 
why they didn't actually ascend into heaven, although they did not die. So as Jesus lifts up the ascension and puts it on par with the incarnation with Christmas, it makes you wonder why we don't have as many people running around buying fog or cloud machines as we do Christmas trees. I suspect that one reason might be that Christmas trees are cheaper and more accessible, and fog machines are more expensive and a little bit awkward to have in your house. Cumbersome, too. So if you think about that analogy, I think it fits the difference between Christmas and Ascension. Christmas is celebrated because it's easy. It's tangible. You've got Jesus there. Jesus is right there in the manger. Ascension is more ethereal. It's less tangible, of course. But I really think the, really, the real reason between the elevation of Christmas in our contemporary culture is not only because you get gifts, which is a big deal in our culture, but it's because people don't really appreciate that Ascension really is about Christmas kind of on steroids. It's about God really being with us, and he's in one way at least more with us than the incarnation. Let me explain. So when Jesus was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man, he was in a manger in Bethlehem. He would be sleeping in the back of a boat on the Sea of Galilee, or he would be nailed to a cross in Jerusalem. If you wanted to find Jesus in the days of his ministry, you could go look for him and find him at one place at one time. But the ascension means that Jesus is far more accessible it also means that Jesus is actually using his power every day in every place for every saint, for believers. The ascension is our specific blessing. St. Paul is praying that we get this in the opening chapter of Ephesians. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? I find it interesting that St. Paul uses the phrase, the eyes of your heart. And I'm pretty sure we don't have eyes in our heart. But I think it's an ascension phrase. Paul is pointing out something that we don't see. We don't see eyes in our heart. We don't see Jesus right now. And yet, it's very real to Paul. That's because we walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible teaches us that both the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and the omnipresence of Christ to be fully available to us required the ascension. Jesus said he must ascend in order for those things to happen. Think about Easter morning. When he met Mary Magdalene in the garden after the resurrection, what did he say to her? Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go and tell our brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary wanted to hang on to the tangible Jesus. And Jesus is saying, no, you can't hang on to this, but you can hang on to something even better. We all want that tactile, bodily presence of Jesus. We think it might make the world better. And that's included in the Acts reading as the disciples ask Jesus, well, in their minds, this is the perfect time. Is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You're alive? Go down there and show those unbelieving fools that you are the Christ. In our fleshly thinking, we want to keep Christmas going. We want to have Jesus as king sitting somewhere and bringing peace to this world which we think it doesn't have. But we walk by faith, not by sight. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, not of this realm, doesn't operate like the political processes that we desire would bring peace. He brings peace in a far more profound and lasting way by grace and forgiveness with God Almighty. He's going to come back one day the same way he went as what the angels said, except the difference is that when he comes back in the clouds, 
representing his power and glory and presence, every eye will see him. John, in the book of Revelation, opening chapter, verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so. Amen. We're going to be looking upon him who we have pierced, but we're going to welcome him back. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, because we know he came to forgive us. So Christmas gives us Christ in the cradle. Good Friday gives us Christ on the cross. Easter gives us the bodily resurrected Christ Jesus. And as we heard in the Acts reading, who appeared with many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. But St. Paul tells us that the ascension gives us an accessible, almighty God who is working for us all the time. Easter was Jesus' first step in the exaltation. The next step was the ascension. And his final exaltation will come when he returns to judge the heaven and the earth. Once again, let me read to you Ephesians, these verses about the power God is working towards us. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all, in all. Jesus ascended for you, the church, so that he might find his fullness in us. I want you to think about this illustration. St. John begins his gospel by saying, in him was light, and life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend or overpower it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld its glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So I used this illustration in chapel yesterday and today. There's a single point of light here. And it's pointing up. Jesus ascended up. He didn't have to. We know after Easter, he was appearing, disappearing behind closed doors. But he specifically chose to go up because he is showing us that he is over everything. It's a power sign. So I want you to take a look at the candle. It's bringing us light. And I'm going to blow it out. And what happens to the smoke? It goes up, it's going over, from place to place. And when I did this at this point, and I asked the kids, what happened to the smoke? And eventually that smoke disappeared. Some of them said, it's magic. Well, no, the carbon is still floating around. Eventually you can't see it, though. It's a good analogy for this for the ascension. At one place in the incarnation, Jesus is located, and then when he ascends, he fills all and is in all. And so it gives us a proximity to Jesus. And in the same way that we have to believe that the carbon is still floating in the air, even though we don't see the smoke, in a similar way, we believe that Jesus is our Savior. The difference being that the faith in Christ is divinely given. It's actually easier to believe that Christ is present because it's God's gift. Jesus' presence is in the church also. We are to see him in the church. We're going to taste him and consume him in the sacrament. His visible elements receive as we receive Christ. But the presence of Christ is potent because God is rich in mercy. 
Ephesians is filled with references to the ascension of Christ, and this particular verse in chapter 2 says that we were dead in our transgressions and he made us alive by grace you have been saved. He keeps saying that in chapter 2. He raised us up with them and seated us in the heavenly places with Christ. By faith, you are living above it all. People get so caught up in the controversies and the chaos of the world, but Christians should be above that. We're seated in the heavenly places. Imagine that. No, believe that. We struggle to believe that Jesus is in power, usually because we walk by sight, not by faith. We've got problems that surround us. We're caught up with our own burdens and our own weak faith. Paul prays that we have knowledge of the hope of his calling and his power towards us who believe. God wants to see that belief in our life and in our love. And Paul said he saw it in the Ephesus church. And then when you get the revelation, what does he say? You lost that first love, Ephesians. Something happened. The world must have encroached upon them and they forgot about Christ. I used another illustration in chapel, and that was the clouds. Yesterday, we had great clouds and sun, uh, and today, when we had chapel, I directed them to the sky, and it looked a lot like this. No clouds. I mean, it's Ithaca. You expect clouds in Ithaca. So I was going to use the analogy that the clouds were a, rem- a, a presence, a reminder of the presence of Christ, like the tabernacle cloud during the Exodus, and when Jesus was transfigured, they were enveloped in a cloud. Clouds, those two clouds, were a reminder of the power and presence of Christ. So I didn't have any clouds. So it was kind of a halfway illustration. So I told the kids, I said, look it, if you see clouds later on, especially if you go out to play, let me know. Come and find me. Totally forgot about that. Was on a Zoom call talking to people who are across America, different Lutherans, a small group of Lutherans trying to help other Lutherans who are not on the Zoom call. And those Lutherans that we were talking about, we perceived had been making significant errors, bumbling errors, embarrassing errors, frustrating errors. They were shooting themselves in the foot. And as we continued to talk, I could almost smell the smoke of self-righteousness among the people on the Zoom call, including your pastor. And right about at the apex of our frustration, there was a knock on the window. My microphone was on, and the people on the Zoom could hear it. And I'm like, not knowing why they're knocking on my window, because I forgot about the cloud. And they said to me, we see the clouds. Jesus is with us. It was a Kairos moment. His fullness is in the church. And there were a bunch of people in the church complaining about other people in the church. And so I had to stop the Zoom call, and I shared with the people on the Zoom call. I said, I got to tell you why I had to step over there and see these kids. Because they reminded me of the clouds the presence of Christ, Jesus is with us. The next time you see a cloud, remember that Christ is with you. The next time you see a cloud, remember that Christ is calling us to the upward calling above wherever you are in your poor, miserable sinner along with me and everybody else. The next time you see a cloud, remember that the church is his body, the fullness of him which fills all and is in all, The next time you see a cloud, remember that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father above all power, even the demons and sin. And I want to leave you with this passage from Romans, which really tells us about the power that Jesus is using every day towards us who believe. Who is the one who condemns, St. Paul says? Christ Jesus is he who died, rather who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. No one has the power to say anything against Christ's intercession, certainly not your accuser of the devil. Jesus just says, 
Look at what I did. At the right hand, he is above all of our plight. Christ is calling us up. The church is God's holy smoke filling the world with the fragrance of love. Come, Lord Jesus, open our eyes. Amen. We um, rise and sing the offertory hymn about God's great grace, Create in Me a Clean Heart, on page 5 in your bulletin. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for being at the right hand of the Father, a symbolic position of power where you are over everything. Use us, Lord, as the church, your body, to fill all and represent you wherever we go. Let us listen to our head, who is Christ. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Normally on Ascension, we have our confirmands question, um, tipping our hat a little bit to that. We have one part of the catechism. It is the explanation to the second article. So if you turn to page six in your bulletin, you will find uh, the Apostles' Creed, and then in the middle of it, the explanation to the second article. Please join with me as we read uh, the creed and the meaning. I believe in God the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, maker maker of of heaven and and earth. And in Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, Son, our Lord, Lord, who was conceived conceived by the Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered suffered under under Pontius Pilate, Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. buried. He He descended descended into hell. hell. The third day he he rose rose again from the dead. dead. He ascended ascended into heaven and and sits at the right right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence we will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that that Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, true God, begotten begotten of the the Father Father from eternity, eternity, and also also true man, born born of the Virgin Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and and condemned condemned person, person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We gather our hearts together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had supped and given thanks, 
He gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. And as we come up for communion, um, we will keep safe social distancing between family units, but uh, we're going to receive communion at the rail tonight.
give thanks to the Lord for he is good. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May the Lord be with you. Bless me the Lord. Thanks be to God. Go with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. For our closing hymn, we have three verses sung by the soloist and three verses sung by the congregation. It's on your back page, page nine.